Margarita, would you please call the roll? Yes. Uh, Chair Marty Rosen? Here. Vice Chair Bill Zimmerman? Here. Commissioner Ken Gaunt? Here. Commi Commissioner Richard Croy? Here. And Commissioner Tom Gidroyce? Here. Uh, okay. Who, who did it last year, last time? Anybody remember? I did. Okay. Ken, uh, Ken, would you? <clears throat> Ready for you, Ken. Ken, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll have to create a list of who does what so I don't forget anybody. That doesn't matter. Uh, okay. I keep doing that. Uh. Madam Clerk, is, are there any changes, modifications to the agenda? None? Okay, then we approve the agenda as is. And we go to item five, which is a presentation uh, by Valleywide on the Aldergate Dog Park. you get closer to that? Uh, be my yeah, is please. It, is it on? Use area for canines. Um, that that progressed as a an idea that stemmed from the community, and at that time we worked with the city of Menifee and put some fencing in. Um, no no real major improvements there, but enough to get it to where it was usable, so we could post some signs and people knew exactly what it was. So over the years, uh, we responded to requests and whatnot at the facility. So today we have Aldergate Dog Park and I'm just going to read a little bit of blurb off of this larger sheet that you have in front of you. Seven acre park located at the corner of Aldergate and Menifee Road. The original park design included one ball field, two basketball courts, two pickleball courts, a play area and restroom facilities. Shortly after completion and the opening, local residents began using Aldergate Park's water detention basin as a dog park. The detention basin has gone through some changes throughout the years at the request of residents. Recently, Valley Wides was approached by a group of residents willing to make a commitment to assist Valley Wide in developing the detention basin and making it more, making it more user friendly. With the support from the Valley Wide Board of Directors and the Friends of Valley Wide Foundation, Valley Wide staff and local residents have begun the process of renovating the facility as well as developing the facility. The development portion of it really, really kind of stems with the small dog park area which as you can see on the map here is located to the northern section contiguous with the existing basin used as the large, large dog park. Friends of Valley Wide Foundation, and this is our fundraising arm of Valley Wide, is very happy to be supporting the Menifee area and the park district by donating $5,000 to this park improvement. 
and we'll be matching funds up to $15,000 raised during any of the events that we do, in particular the one coming up in October, which is Menifee Dog Days. The Friends of Valleywide Foundation is hosting the first annual Menifee Dog Days, a canine festival and contest. This event will be held Saturday, October 11, 2014 at Valleywide's Aldergate Dog Park. All proceeds raised from this event will help with the costs needed for improvements for the dog park and for Menifee Valley Humane Society. We hope you might join us for a dog on day of fun with the pet parade, food vendors, silent auction table, music, and much more. So as we go through, and what is stated here earlier is, is that we do have a project. Uh, the project includes all of the requests and desires that came from the community at some of the original meetings. So as we put together this list of projects, we kind of came up with the plan of what you see here today that's in front of you. And that plan consists of many improvements that won't be done originally on the first phase. The first phase is strictly geared towards developing the park to get it open and get it usable. So that will include fencing in the small dog park area, the renovations in the detention basin area with the addition of some trees, and uh, the concrete improvements and whatnot. So the total cost, if we were to put all amenities together, and we'll call this a wish list, is $59,000, $59,100. That's everything. We have the funding to get the, the, uh, uh, the park open uh, through the contribution of the board of directors from park development as well as the funds that have been provided by the foundation. So we're very pleased with that, that we're underway in construction now. So I'm here to answer any questions and also to extend that invitation to you on October 11th. We believe it's just gonna be a great day. The weather should be perfect. We're gonna have fun time events. And the thing about this is really we're establishing history that's been driven by the community because this in fact will be the first Dog Days event uh, yeah, at the Aldergate Dog Park. So we anticipate that there will be hundreds to follow. Um, I've also included in the package with, uh, that you're looking at uh, something that's not on the agenda, but for your information, is just a little small publication called Valleywide Growing. Uh, this is throughout our entire district, some of the news of development that we are working on, as well as the formal invitation that's Menifee Dog Days for Saturday, October 11th, that gets you a little bit more information and a phone number to call. It would be my great honor to answer any questions if there are some. Uh, one, one of the areas that you may, or one of the items that you may see come in your email will be a reminder about our Soapbox Derby, of which we are great, <coughs> greatly proud to be partners with the City of Menifee. With, uh, that happens on Menifee Road, uh, just south of Wheatfield Park, and that's on September 6th, September 6th. So look forward to seeing you there as well, and uh, we're always looking for alternate backup uh, judges if, if any of you are willing. So, thank you. Uh, just a, a question. I I have never heard of a an agency that taxes people having a foundation. This is something new. In, in other words, you, you via the state you tax every person on the east side. Uh, gets added to their tax rolls, mm -hmm. whatever number, which you collect, I don't mean you personally, which Valley White sure. collects. Yeah. And um, I've never heard of a taxing organization also having a foundation to create uh, additional funds. It's a wonderful question. Um, it's um, is, But is that new? Is that a new thing? Or is, is, have you done this in other cities? Oh, absolutely. Uh, our, our foundation was established in 1998, I believe it was. Oh. Um, so uh, our foundation has been very active in the, uh, uh, in the valley-wide communities. Um, a foundation is somewhat uh, not an original idea. Uh, you do see them in other uh, city organizations, uh, also uh, throughout uh, county areas, all up and down the state with park districts. Uh, it's, a very, it's a popular item to do fundraising efforts. Uh, generally, the fundraising is used for purposes of building um, building amenities that are hard hard to or I shouldn't say hard. Uh, the, um, they are items you can grasp. Meaning, if you have a park and you need more bleachers, foundations are great for for that type of activity. 
as well as supplementing what we call our youth scholarship program, uh, which is to help the underprivileged children still to be able to play sports through our scholarship program. So it's an offsetting of program fees. And so those are the, those are the, really the two primary things that our foundation does. Um, I might suggest that uh, like a library, sometimes you see library foundations. Uh, cities also, uh, Robert probably can speak well to this, that cities oftentimes have foundations that help do these uh, fundraising efforts as well. So not a, not a real new idea. And the other great question in regards to that is the uh, taxing authority that uh, kind of was implied with, um, with that as well. Valley Wide operates under uh, the system of levies, um, and, and it's fair to kind of call it a tax because it shows up on your tax bill. There's, it is a financing mechanism. That financing mechanism is solely for the purposes of maintaining what is already there. And so those funds that come in, uh, it's a very labor-intensive process every year through uh, working, with, um, uh, working with our governmental engineers to ensure that what these, what these levies are for is to maintain the existing infrastructure that's already there. Um, so it's a little bit, um, it's not like a general type, like a general city would be where they collect different types of uh, taxes and levies. These are very specific and they're very restricted revenue funds to maintain what is there. In this particular situation, uh, the park, the funds that are collected through the levies to maintain the park system and the streetscapes is very specific to only that portion of um, landscaping. So there wouldn't be any extra money for any other capital improvement? No, capital improvements are not part of that unless they are part of what's called the capital asset management plan. <coughs> Um, so if you can imagine that uh, we put in a pickleball court and it gets used for 25 years, it's going to need resurfacing, it's going to need, you know, those types of things to keep whatever the asset was, the ability to do its intended purpose. So sometimes basketball needs to be replaced or fencing needs to be replaced or playground structures uh, get beat up in the sun and they need to be replaced. So that, those funds are also built into that is to replace those existing assets through a, through a study that says what their useful life is. Thank you. Yeah, very complicated. Hi, thanks for clarifying that. You just Thank cleared you. up a lot of questions uh, regarding that for me. Um, my question is a little bit more to the design aspect of it. Uh, currently, this is it has a ball field on it, right? Is it is this? Yes. Uh, this does not replace any of those uh, amenities at the site. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, I suppose that if we really kind of look at this. Uh, uh, and it's designed to show you the, <laughs> the development, but if we really look closely at it, you can see the outline of the parking lot, and if you can imagine that the ball field sits up in this particular area here, up, okay. up north, so that amenity stays with, with the park. Okay. There'll be no, nothing replaced. And, and this, this is uh, obviously, if you build it, they will come. It seems like there's a real strong need for that up there. Um, and the fencing, I'm kind of looking at the design here, the fencing goes around the small dog area, and that's to act as a separator between the big and small. Right. Yeah. Yes. To keep them from. Exactly. I've even uh, I've even heard it referred to uh, nowadays as the shy dog area. You know. So <laughs> I guess you. <laughs> but yeah. it's intended for small dogs. Yeah. yeah. No. I have a hundred pound German Shepherd. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's always the little shy. dog that you know, yeah. a, <laughs> That's been my experience. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Um, well, uh, Mr. Wetter, I appreciate the uh, the presentation. I like the creativity you guys are doing. Um, having a foundation is something that I'm familiar with on some other uh, organizations that I'm with. So it's a uh, it's a nonprofit way of raising funds and doing something. If you've got a group of people that want to help out, and that's kind of a philanthropic way to do that. Um, <clears throat> so I'm glad you guys are doing that and looking for ways to fund this. Um, can, can you, I, my question, Dean, is, you know, the people in the community really are the ones that generated this and asked for a separator um, from small dogs to big dogs and to solve that problem. And so I, I, I believe that most of the people that requested that were thinking it was something as simple as putting a divider fence and that would be a couple of thousand bucks and then we'd be all said and done and everybody's happy. $60,000 makes a lot of people go, whoa, how did we get to that? So can you help us understand 
some of the more costly things. Are you ex uh, extending water lines? Are you doing grading? Is there things, an um, incredible amount of landscaping that's going to be added or, or, or uh, revised that brought us up to the 60,000? Maybe you could help shed a little light on that. Yeah, you know, I don't, the, the interesting part about that is, is as I look through the budget, the, there's nothing that really stands out that is the one big item, with the exception of the, um, the dog watering bowl slash drinking fountain combinations I thought were a little excessive. Uh, our quote on those were about $5,000, uh, which seems ridiculous because uh, um, the, at the end of the day, we can come up with a better solution for, for less cost than that. Um, uh, but outside of that, it's just a lot of little things when you start adding up benches and whatnot. And we do buy good quality, and that's uh, one of the things at Valley Wide. Uh, what we're looking at when we build something is we want it sustainable, meaning that we want it to last a long time. Uh, so when we buy a bench, we buy a bench that's designed to be used um, at, at its fullest and out in the weather at all times. And so, you know, it's not uncommon to have a bench cost eight or $900. And so all those things, and, and I understand if we were to do it in... Uh, if we were to do a project in our backyard, we would probably look at a different approach. What we're looking at is, is we want to do this right, we want to do it one time, and we want to be able to maintain it. And so there are some costs in there, and so I kind of allude to the valley, the valley wide re way really has been is that um, if you need a drill, you know, you can go down and you can buy a very expensive yellow drill. Um, or you can go to Harbor Freight and you can buy a very inexpensive light blue drill or whatever. But there's something in between that's going to give you that service life that you want. That's not, not so much the least cost, but it's providing you the best value. It's going to be in your garage for many years providing you a service. And that's kind of how we look at the amenities, if that kind of answers your question. I do have a draft, draft budget I can share with. Uh, it's no secret. It's a, it's a public document. I can share that budget with you. I, but think that I would love to see that myself. Yeah. And what's nice about that is after I've shared that budget, we've had people come out and tell us that they want to donate certain things. Uh, we've had a great deal of involvement from Lowe's, uh, the local, uh, uh, local branch here. So it's just been phenomenal. This, this project has been positive from day one, from our first meeting with the community out there at the site. Good. Uh, Tom. Uh, since you don't totally have this funded, is there a timeline as far as progressing into this? Are you going to wait till all the money is there, do it in steps? What's the situation? Sure. Um, a lot of what happens happens behind the scenes on projects to get ready for what you'll actually see as a tractor on site or you'll see something of that nature. Um, the, the work that's being done in the detention basin has uh, we put together somewhat of a, a preliminary schedule where we told the originators that we met out with is this is what I think we can do by, uh, by Independence Day, we'll have this done. We're ahead of schedule as far as the work that we said we were going to do. Uh, right now where we're at is we're going to be relocating some irrigation so that the Lowe's group can come in and start putting up fence posts and then we're also going to be working with uh, um, the local Cal Fire folks and the conservation camps to start coming in and doing some concrete work as soon as the fire season lets up. So uh, we're uh, we're moving, our original goal was to have something by uh, what we were, we were saying is, is that um, we want a time frame of about six months, which puts us at about the first of the year. We're hoping to have the, the dog park, the small dog park and the large dog, dog park opened up um, by our event. Now I say hoping because there could be a lot of things that get in our way. It could be inclement weather, it could be um, delays in some of the volunteer work or it could be a, a fire that pulls some of our resources away but at the end of the day we're going to try to do that because we think that that would be just an absolute great day to open up that small park small dog park Good, thank you yeah uh, do you have that uh, budget with you or is it something you're going to send to us or I can I can send it to you because I have uh, I have some of my personal notes on the one that I have here in the folder, but yes, I do have it, and I can send it to you. Thank you. We greatly appreciate it. Are there any other questions? Hearing none, thank you so much. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Brings us to public comments on non-agenda items. Again, Madam Clerk, are there any? No, I have no speaker slips. Thank you. None. That brings us to the approval of our me meeting minutes. Uh, there have been two. Uh, let's take the first one, minutes of July 24. 
Everyone has received it. Are there any changes? Yes. On the minutes for July 24th on page four, it shows me making a, a motion and seconding it. Okay. Got that, that could be a problem. Yeah, I thought it might be. Margarita, you have that? Yes. Good. Anything else? Uh, then I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Uh, with that change. Right. Uh, second. A sec and a second by Rick. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, it is approved. Let's go to the second one, minutes of August 14th. Again, are there any changes required? Hearing none, I would ask for a motion to so accept. Moved. So moved. And a second. Well, what is the motion? To accept the minutes of August 14th. Oh, I forgot there was a second one. Sorry. Uh, Rick seconds it. I'll second the second. All in favor? Aye. Po uh, opposed? It's approved. Brings us to discussion items. Uh, 8.1, parking and safety issues at Audie Murphy. Uh, Mr. Lennox, are you going to give a presentation? Yes, thank you, uh, Commission, uh, Chair. Uh, I'll give a brief intro and then I'll hand it over to Alan Young to explain some of the progress that's occurred since uh, the park's been open and also what's been proposed uh, through our Public Works Department. Um, as you may have seen yourself or heard from some of the reports, uh, since the opening in May, uh, there's been a lot of fanfare and use of the park, uh, in particular by those who frequent the skate park area, uh, which essentially is just off of Newport Road, uh, closer to uh, Derby Hill Road. So. Uh, what that has meant, though, is if you uh, can envision the park site, the parking lot is, uh, both parking lots are not on that end of the park, um, which in essence is a little bit of a design flaw, um, but nonetheless, it is what we have now. Uh, and as a result, those skaters and some BMXers uh, park along Newport on a curb that isn't identified as, as parking or non-parking. It is a, a gray curb. Uh, with a, an adjacent bike lane and then three lanes of traffic that are headed in the eastbound direction. Uh, and so as they park there, um, they sort of indiscriminately uh, cross the landscaped uh, easement and over to the sidewalk and then into the park uh, so they can get into the skate park area. Uh, and so um, there are some, obviously some safety issues. We've fielded a number of complaints from residents who are concerned about uh, cars that travel down that road at 50 plus miles an hour uh, with uh, sometimes young kids who are uh, accessing the park from that same street level um, exiting cars there uh, it is a true challenge uh, and risk uh, in addition to that within the park uh, there are there have been since the opening several safety issues that have come up um, in particular it's uh, mostly related to vandalism many of which we've addressed um, and so I, I want to go ahead and hand it over to Alan. He can run through the specific, specifics of what we've done since the opening and what we're working on still. So, This slide right here uh, it shows uh, we installed uh, additional cameras with a signage uh, to deter some uh, vandalism. Uh, we installed this uh, maybe two, three weeks after the park opened. And then um, the park was installed with uh, teak wood furniture uh, for park benches and trash receptacles, and uh, they did not last too well. And um, so we went out to uh, informal bid, and uh, we got bids for uh, metal furnishings. Uh, they have a, a seven-year fin uh, finish warranty and 20-year structure warranty to replace the wooden uh, park furnishings out there. And then, so the exhibit on the screen now is actually what was presented to City Council two meetings ago as the proposed uh, uh, fix to some of the issues along Newport. Um, this was done just during the City Manager's comments, so it hasn't actually been formally approved by Council, um, 
what is being proposed is restriping of Newport between Derby Hill and Lone Pine. Uh, to what you see on the screen here. Um, there is one modification uh, that was made there after uh, that meeting, uh, after I had a chance to sit down and meet with the Public Works Director. Uh, what you see in the first section there is parking with a seven foot width and then a bike lane of a five foot width and then you see 12, 11 and then 12 for the uh, lanes for the, uh, for the cars. And in looking at uh, some of the standards, uh, typically bike lanes have a minimum of six, six foot, especially when they're adjacent to um, a, a lane for traffic, for vehicle traffic. So um, what that would mean is shrinking uh, one of those lanes, preferably the number um, one lane closest to the center median, uh, down to 11 uh, and expanding that additional foot on the bike lane. So there's a little more safety. Um, also, typically, though, when there is a bike lane adjacent to uh, uh, this type of um, road or, or lanes of traffic, there is a buffer um, of two to three feet. That obviously is not included here. Uh, so there is still some concern that this is a safety issue. Um, we're not adding any additional width to the overall curb to curb distance. So um, there's still a problem. But uh, the striping is intended to at least um, immediately address uh, where cars travel and where pedestrians and bikes travel and where f cars park. Um, so this is, this is sort of a first step, um, but this is what we have so far. Can you handle a couple of questions while we're here? Absolutely. Uh, Rick was first, yeah. Mm, Rick, please. Yeah. Um, number one, my concern is do those widths, obviously they're going to have to meet the state requirements for width. Um, the thing that I see is that number one lane is always trucks. I see that as a problem. Is, what, is there any sort of additional signage we can put at the beginning, you know, of on the street on Newport Road, you know, caution bicycles, like, you know, we have caution horses, bikers, all that stuff. Is there something that we can do, you know, as you come down the hill? Sure. Um, coming eastbound coming I mean eastbound yes uh, there is signage that can be placed before you actually approach Lone Pine mm -hmm. uh, on the right shoulder to inform uh, you know motorists that that this there's a lane there's a there's the striping is changing um, and that they should be aware of the merge so to speak um, so yes uh, I think we can go back to our public works department with that and Mike obviously with what happened a few weeks ago on Dominagoni you can't stop knuckleheads from being knuckleheads, but it, whatever we can do to mitigate and, and make awareness that, hey, there are going to be bicycles here, please be careful. Yeah, absolutely. Tom? Yeah, what is the post, um, I get this thing right, what, what is the posted speed limit going eastbound now? Right now, it's not posted. Um, the assumed speed limit based off of the width of traffic, the width of, uh, or the number of lanes, um, is uh, 45. Uh, the city just recently um, approved a, a speed survey, which I believe is to include this arterial. Um, with, and after it's completed, they'll be able to post those and enforce them. So then with this modification, would the city go back and reconsider maybe lowering the speed limit as, an old, as, as a safety measure like Rick is talking about? They could. That's, that's going to depend on the outcome of the speed survey. So with speed surveys, they, they'll lay down a, you know, a meter and determine the flow of traffic and how fast all the cars are going, the volume of cars, uh, but also take into account how wide each lane is and how many lanes there are. So that, that, could dic that dictates the speed limit. One other thing related to it, how much more parking does this going to provide? Is it going to be enough for the problem we have? Well, uh, you know, it's linear parking, uh, so it's not stacked. Um, and so what we've seen at the site is that at any given time at the peak of activity, which would have been at the tail end of the summer before the kids were back in school, we would see up to 20 cars on that, on that shoulder. Um, that distance from Lone Pine to Derby can probably accommodate maybe 50 to 60 all the way down from corner to corner. Uh, the reality though is once we get back into the sports seasons like baseball and soccer, uh, this is the easiest and most direct uh, access to the sport field. Um, so in addition to the parking issue, we've got landscaping issue along the curb 
leading into the park because it was not designed for access from Newport. So there is actually two rail vinyl fence, there's uh, drought tolerant plants, there's uh, drip systems, everything, ground cover that we have to examine for possibly modifying as a result of, of this parking option. So folks who park there aren't killing everything on their way in. So, And that kind of leads into my question. Um, is there not adequate parking within the site? And could we simply post no parking signs and eliminate this whole safety issue altogether? And when you say the peak season with baseball, soccer happening, is there adequate parking for that as well? Uh, it's in my opinion that it's not adequate within the park. There's two parking lots, one that's off of Lone Pine and then one on more interior on the mm -hmm. south side of the park uh, where the restroom building is. At its peak use, I do not believe that's sufficient parking. So what, what will happen is when those get filled up, uh, folks will park in the, in the adjacent communities, uh, which typically will make uh, residents not so happy. Um, and perhaps the action of allowing parking along Newport is to maximize all parking opportunities. Um, but yeah, posting no parking signs would force people to use those lots. They would fill up though at peak use. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Ken? I, uh, uh, Mr. Zimmerman um, asked the questions I was going to ask. Sorry. And I appreciate the answer. But I really think there's going to be a problem with uh, reducing that lane down, that middle lane down to 11 feet, the way the traffic goes down through there. I too would like to see some little more research into another place to park and, and go with no parking entirely. And I understand your answer, that's not likely either, but I just don't think we should just go along with going down to 11 feet and that middle lane. I mean, if we were gonna go to a slower lane, why isn't it in the slow lane rather than the faster lanes? Uh, I don't know if it makes sense or not. It doesn't to me. I have just one question. If instead of parking parallel, we had them park head in, wouldn't you get a lot more parking in? Uh, you might, although you have to remember that flow of traffic is at a pretty high rate of uh, it's, it's fast, and, and so the only way you can do that is if you cut into the shoulder. And internally, we have discussed the idea of, uh, you know, cutting into the landscaped uh, uh, easement there by 15 feet or so up to the sidewalk edge so that we could have additional parking. What you don't see on the image here is as you continue further west, there's actually a bus turnout which currently isn't used. It's intended to be a future stop um, once all of Audie Murphy is built out. Um, but if that turnout was to continue all the way up the street and you just reserve that turnout where it is just for bus and everything uh, westbound for parking, then certainly you could, you could come up with some creative op options for that. That's a fairly expensive uh, concept uh, because usually uh, you have to ensure that that's um, well, you have to create an additional shoulder for folks to pull in and out, uh, likely angled parking. Um, but it, it is something we've discussed internally with the Public Works Department. It, it's, it's really going to be a matter of cost. Rick? Let me add to your headache. <laughs> um, a novel idea. Across the street is a lot of open space. The idea, there is a crosswalk there at, I forget what the name of the street is, but the main entrance. I, can, I can't imagine what kind of EIR and all the technical studies, but putting additional parking space across the street and having people walk to the park seems like a, a, a good answer. Yeah, you're going to take some of that space away in Salt Creek Channel, but this looks, I, I, common sense dictates that this doesn't seem like a winnable situation with continuing I, I just see trucks coming down that hill all the time, and it's not pretty. 
Ken. Uh, Tom, I'm sorry. Well, in thinking in terms of solutions, you mentioned possibly doing something with that green space by the sidewalk. It would seem expensive, but putting the bike lane there would probably be safer for the bikers and get them out of the traffic and then leave the road wider. Perhaps that's more doable. I'd hate to think of people crossing the road simply because everybody does drive so fast, and if you've got kids crossing the road, they're not going to pay attention. It'd be very unsafe. Anything else? Uh, I gather that we are not voting on anything here. We are merely accepting. We're halfway through the presentation. Yeah, there's more? Well, that, that's the extent of what we've done so far. Um, the, the, any, any feedback you provide, we are going to go back to our Public Works Department and propose additional measures and see if it's within, um, well, within budget one and, and two, um, their resources to, to accomplish immediately. Um, but some of this feedback is good uh, because it's, it's sort of an external uh, opinion of what could be the safest alternative. So. Okay. So, so tonight, do we need a motion to receive and file, or? Okay. So, then so moved. Oh, please. Thank you. Uh, I have a motion to receive the file. Uh, do I have a second? Second. I have a second by Ken. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Here we are. We've received it. <clears throat> That brings us to item 8.2, potential staging areas and trailheads. Again, <laughs> okay, Robert. Thank you. Uh, it, this was a result of a request from the commission, uh, I believe during our strategic um, planning workshop, uh, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, and so staff's been working to compile uh, obviously, uh, some maps as requested of uh, the city, and we've broken it into quadrants and then overlaid uh, the existing trails that we know exist, uh, as well as the parks uh, within the city uh, for consideration of those staging areas. The assumption here is that uh, some of the commissioners had already in mind uh, certain locations that might serve as good trailheads um, and possible staging uh, areas for equestrian use. Uh, so with that, I, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Margarita um, to sort of run through the maps quickly and then turn it over to Commission uh, for any, any ideas. Hi. So basically you have four maps, um, northeast, northwest, and southwest, and southeast for you um, to review and kind of get a, an idea of the city, but close-ups um, with each of the trails included. Where are we proposing that there be trailheads or staging areas, whatever you want to call it? Um, we need an area or we need areas that are roughly two acres, uh, places where we could bring in water. Uh, but besides that, maybe just some uh, rails so horses could be tied up, but that's about it. All you need is an area where a truck could come in and park, um, but obviously we need permission on uh, areas that are um, private property. And uh, Margarita, are you proposing any particular areas? For this? No, if you want to go maybe um, quadrant by quadrant or area and, and kind of identify potential areas that you guys may be considering them. I'll raise my hand. Okay. Southwest. Uh, Rick, please. Southwest area of the city. Southwest? Hold southwest. On. Um, <clears throat> historically, there's. You would start with the fourth one. Go ahead. Yeah. Historically, uh, in the bottom right hand corner, on Keller Road, you see a couple of water towers there. Um, uh, I ride that area all the time. Um, and I, I think that, uh, w once again, there's, 
it's on the border of the city, so I don't know if we could strike up a conversation with uh, uh, EMWD to get something going there. I think that they'd be, I've heard in the past uh, from writing there with Lynn Maddox that they'd be amenable to working with the city and uh, we did the we did a function uh, at uh, KBN Park where we get some volunteers together. We get we get some uh, volunteer sources, much like uh, Dean does, and and uh, throw up some hitching posts and find a water line and throw it in there, and it's good to go. And it's very low maintenance, low cost, and and I think that uh, project at KBN costs is about 750 bucks, and uh, it's just a matter of uh, going and scoping it out a little bit. I'd like to put a circle around that area as a possibility. Maybe if that's what we want to do is just draw some rough stuff and circles and that's a good one. And yes. and you know for a fact that that belongs to EMWD? Yeah. So a uh, conversation with Ron Sullivan. That's right. uh, and just so you know, Ron has already given permission for uh, a couple of groups to use that as a staging area informally. Mm -hmm. So I know he would be amenable. It's just a matter of yeah. Uh, the city staffer sitting down with them and preparing seeing, something seeing, seeing what legal. We do as far I, as I, I think what we're trying to get to is a map that we can have at the front counter out here when somebody comes and says, "Where can I ride my horse in this yeah, town?" Yeah, I agree. Boom. And it's right here. Yeah, right where the water tanks are. Yes. And for clarification, is it right here where the mouse is right now? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, and what, what we can do is, as you identify these this evening, we'll go back, staff will go back and uh, look up property owners, if it's an agency or if it's a private owner, and see if um, there's some negotiating potential there to do these things. Yeah, good. Um, um, might, might I suggest as a, a thing, I, I think the important thing as far as the staging area, since we have pretty good connectivity, one on each corner north, south, east, west. I think we can simplify our search that way. Tom? I, I think it's important that wherever we have a staging area it connects to a network of trails, not that it's just one that maybe goes in a single direction. Mm -hmm. So looking at the northeast, it seems to me that we ought to have something near the Marion Ashley Center. We have a regional trail right there that would go north, south, then connects down into a whole string of other trails. Northeast. If you look at number 19, which is the Ashley Center. <coughs> number 19, yes. That would seem like a, a sensible place to have one. Mm -hmm. Can can I uh, speak to that? Sure. Of course. Um, I, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware that there is a project uh, called Trailmark. It's a specific plan. It is just, if you look at the corner of the yellow line, which is MAPES, all the way in the north, east corner and then the blue line coming up is Briggs and Trailmark is just beyond our city boundary which is MAPES the yellow line and it has in its design uh, a full staging area with multiple parking spaces that are long enough for a trailer for horses and all that so that may satisfy that area because really the, the ideal riding area is to the north uh, what is that called, Rick, that area? Um, Juniper Flats. Yeah, Juniper Flats, thank you. And that's kind of where, where yeah, the good ride Who's is. responsible for Trailmark? Um, I don't remember the name of the developer, but I can get all that for you. But, okay. but basically it's... Here, it's, it's uh, except that that, of course, is county. Outside of our city. It's just outside, yeah. but it may serve the purpose of what we're trying to do because the good riding is... And we could Let's get permission from the county I'm sure to send residents of the city there if you know they wish to start off from there. Now, of course, you can head up into the mountains from there. So there is a major trail system over there. Well, that's the other feature we were talking about is the Edison line that goes up that way with that green belt. That's right. So I gave a revised exhibit to Margarita that shows where that public utility corridor uh, uh, angles across and it goes right through. In fact, this, this trail mark project that I'm talking about, they are taking advantage of the public utility corridor and they've designed a full park and, and trails and all that underneath the power lines and so it's not a, a um, 
a constraint, it's, a, it's an opportunity. And so they've really kind of uh, done what I hope we're going to do as well because, like I said, we've got tremendous uh, opportunities with, with that along McLaughlin. Rick? And the good part is, is that along Mapes there, there is a planned uh, multi-purpose trail along Mapes all the way around that project. So you have connectivity, which is great. Okay. Are we satisfied to do that outside of the city without doing anyone anything in the city? <laughs> the, the other one would be on the northwest area of the city, and that's obviously KBN Park, like we were talking about. And unfortunately, it's just as out, much as we have tried, KBN Park still belongs to Paris. It's just outside. But it should be shown on this map just so that people can see that there is a staging area there. Um, you can mark that existing. Existing staging area, KBN Park, even though it's just outside the city's boundary, it's, it serves the city, I guess would be the way to say it. Tom, go ahead. Oh, with, with regard to Cabian, that is in the city limits of Paris. However, we, we know that Paris is not heading in the direction of becoming a horse community. Their general plan doesn't provide for trails. Um, I'd like to suggest as a future agenda item that we discuss that further, the fact that the park is in their city limits and that it's probably something we ought to look into sharing responsibility for with them as a joint venture. Uh, I can tell you that I personally went to Paris when they were considering their trail system. And the first thing that I said to them was, you have an entire trail system for the city and you have exactly 400 feet of equestrian. All right? It was literally a third of a block and nothing else. Uh, and they said they wanted it that way. So they do not want equestrian trails within the city. Uh, however, they do own Cabian, even though they are not actually maintaining it, they have given it back to the county to maintain. Um, we certainly can put it on the agenda for a future item. Uh, and if maybe we could get uh, somebody from from the parks to come talk about Cabian. I'd like to see that. I, I'm thinking that that park's going to get more and more use by our own residents as things build out. And unfortunately, I have been on, I was on trails for three years. I have tried all that time to get county to put a sign up that the staging area exists. They haven't done it yet. Hmm. <clears throat> so uh, the city is not the biggest procrastinator. Okay, thank you. Rick. I just wanted to uh, make, it, you, you brought up a good point. So if they don't do it, then maybe we should just do it. <laughs> we'll put it south of the of the park entrance there. Um, we could do that, but yeah. I don't know the, if the, the thing city about, would want to do that. The thing about uh, uh, connectivity, too, is that there is the uh, San Jacinto River Trail, which takes you all the way up in the, uh, Paris. Um, you can see it running through the top yeah, left top there. Top left, yeah. Um, and you can access all those trails. You can actually ride down into Canyon Lake. Uh, through those trails in, in Cabian Park, there's an equestrian area at the north end of Canyon Lake. So there is good connectivity there. It did, it, although it is a shame that it's not in our purview, it is there and it, it should be on a, a map to show it as an asset, a regional asset. <coughs> yes, Bill. Thank you. Um, if we could turn to our southeast, no, I'm sorry. The one I gave my <laughs> The northeast 
area of the city. <clears throat> and if you look to all the way on the right side of the page, you see the number 32. There's a, a blue line that represents the, um, the regional trail that runs along the north side of Salt Creek. Everybody with me? No, I don't even see 32 to tell you the You're truth. You're on the wrong map. Oh, South, northeast. Oh, northeast. Sorry. Go ahead. And so where I am is here at Trail. Right there. And so that there's there's two spots that are just out just on the east side of Briggs, and I guess it's Lindenberger now. Is that right? Am I in the right place? Maybe. Anyway, right around where that number thirty-two is is a strategic, in my um, perspective, location because we have that flood channel and there's a service access maintenance road on both sides of that that could be developed or used as a, a staging area as well. Am I? I marked the wrong thing. Yeah, right around this here? number 32. On that area or here? Well, in that vicinity. So you've got Salt Creek Channel, and I'm just wondering if on either side of Salt Creek Channel there's an opportunity, and that might be a negotiation with Flood Control District. Or I don't know who owns it, but of course the city could find out. Um, I'm sure it's Flood Control. No, no, Flood Control owns the, uh, the, uh, the Salt Creek, but do they own, uh, I don't think they own the, the, the land outside of Salt what Creek. What it does is it. Uh, but I have no idea. I'm sure that uh, Mr. Lennox could find out, you know, given some time. And I think that's a great idea because we know that we've already got $8 million plus to fix up Salt Creek. And uh, once Salt Creek is done, people could, if they had that staging area, go directly onto Salt Creek and go, you know, east or west, depending on the you know proclivities so um yes i would like to mark an area above salt creek and below salt creek uh to see if uh any of that could be used as a staging area um robert do you know the nature of that mahogany <clears throat> creek park number 32 there on that exhibit? Uh, from my recollection, it's just a general um, neighborhood park. Um, I'd have to dig a we, We've looked at some tentative track maps. I just don't recall what it was entailing. Do you know if it's located on the south end of that project where it actually abuts the flood control channel? I'd, I, I'd have to look at the map again. I don't recall. Okay. I'm just wondering if that can be Worked in. Worked in. Sure. Yeah. I can shed a little light on that. Yeah. There, there is, I've driven by there recently as they're building out, and there is a, a, actually two fences. There's one along the Salt Creek Channel, and then there's another hiking trail internally for the, for the residents there. So. Are you saying along Salt Creek? Yeah, they have, they they have, they have their a own? split rail fence along there. It's, it's okay. interesting. Okay, anything else? If I have it clear, then direction to staff will be to identify the property owners on each of these proposed staging areas, then come back. And see whether with or not they're willing to, uh, obviously we don't need to take the property, all we want is access. Right, it could be a combination, sure, of you know, one so, or the uh, other. If the people are just willing to give us access uh, that would be great um and and of course as as uh we move forward there's always the opportunity to add um to that so w we can continue to work with any property owners uh we should take a look at the southeast mm -hmm. map and try to get something
I could make a recommendation for this area. Uh, Mira Park, which is a valley-wide uh, park, is set right in the middle of a pretty uh, vibrant equestrian neighborhood. Um, again, I, I don't know the property owners around this park, but it does sit by itself uh, to, some, to, to some extent. Um, I think there's some future development planned around it what, down what the road. What number are we talking about? It's, it's actually number 22. But there are quite a bit of um, equestrian owners in that area. I can speak to that. I live there. Um, that's that's Mira Loma, I think it's Mira Loma, Mira Mies. Pier, Mira Park. Mira Park. Yeah, I was, I was close. Um, just north of that is a um, it's a flood control um, dip in there. Um, I do know that. Uh, there was some talk about that land being for sale at some point a while ago, so I don't know. We should probably identify that, but that would be a good area to access um, <clears throat> the Garb Garbani Regional Trail. Um, there's a future trail planned in the county going east along Wickert, um, and there there is a lot of trails around there. I, I can I jump yeah, in there? Please go ahead. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> so if you look on the lower right uh, area of this exhibit, you see w the blue line, which I believe is Warm Springs. That's correct. That's Warm Springs. And to me, having something in that vicinity as well, the fact that it opens access up to the south along Warm Springs and if there's if there's an opportunity in that area. Well, you know that Warm Springs Creek goes right through the reserve, preserve. Yeah. And um, uh, we've had issues with the preserve, but we are we've been told by the county that it will remain open for uh, equestrians. So um, if we could get something near it, close to it, mm -hmm. people could then go right into the preserve as a, for equestrian use for anything else. They're allowed to walk, they're allowed to use uh, uh, mountain bikes as well. So uh, now if you look at the map and the lower part of that blue area, the only trouble is uh, <laughs> it's outside the city again. Because that yellow line represents the boundary. Mm -hmm. But we could look at a staging area just above the yellow line. That little area over there, I'm familiar with it. It's pretty, I mean, it's pretty barren. So I don't know what people have in mind for it. But you know, obviously, it's uh, potentially OK at the moment. So I would recommend that that area just below the blue line and above the yellow um, be a potential staging area as well. So we're looking at uh, two areas by number Tom. 22? Yeah. And down there. Well, of course, we're looking at areas that are several miles apart. We might also want to look at an area further north Uh, Rick? Yeah, um, as you go down south on Briggs there where the red line is, um, that is part of the preserve, but from my understanding is that Edison owns part of that um, property. So once again, there are some easements along there. There's an Edison easement going right down Briggs. That's right. So. Once again, maybe we can take advantage of that as a, an, an entry point um, and see, see if we can do something there. <clears throat> Anything else? Well, you know, in the future we could always add more. Let's see what, if anything, we can make out of what we have so far. Uh, I was hoping that we could get something in the northwest area. 
uh, perhaps around, um, well, between Ethan Ack and Rouse. Now, I know all that property is, is owned and they, I'm sure they have ideas for it, but. Well, <clears throat> go ahead, Rick. The corner of Getz, above, above uh, Rouse, you have all that wonderful green Edison yeah, and, corridor. And we could use that. There's certainly no reason why we shouldn't. It's on both sides of uh, Getz or Valley Boulevard. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes. It's wherever there's power lines, and so those power lines go down to Elsinore. Um, that is a an uh, utility corridor. Right. And we could. You know, that's 300 feet wide, that corridor. I actually had them check it once. 300 feet wide, we, we could put a park in there. I mean, you, you could have fields in there. Edison wouldn't care. You're not doing anything to their land. As long as you don't put a structure up so they can't get to it, they don't care. Has our staff reached out to Ray Hicks or any of the folks over at Edison? Not yet. We wanted to make sure we got through the strategy port first. Okay. <clears throat> so I, I would ask not only for a, um, a possible uh, staging area, but also to use it as a trail or, and or sports fields. Okay. Okay, have we finished all of this? So. Okay. Next. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sorry. Can I ask one more question? Absolutely, I'm sorry, go ahead. Before we leave that. That corridor that we just talked about, the power power line corridor. The utility course, corridor? Yes. It runs clear across the city, across the freeway. We, if we're going to do any um, any uh, investigation or, or questions of the power company about those that corridor, can we include the whole thing? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I yeah. agree. Okay. Because even as a trail, you would simply want to go clear across and then straight up. You can go into the mountains. Okay. From there. Yeah, good. Thank you. Let me just throw one I'm sorry, thing. Sorry, go ahead. I would encourage um, our staff to get a hold of that trail mark plan that I'm talking about, if, if it's a specific plan. But they do have a whole page des uh, just for a design of what's going to happen within the utility, uh, public utility corridor. And, it's pretty neat use. I think they're doing it right. So if we can imitate that in other places, I think we'd be hitting a home run. I've been in, I've been interested in that one a long time. I've got a copy of it. I'll shoot it to you. <laughs> Me too. Save you some time. Yeah. All right. Uh, so that was eight point two. Brings us to eight point three. Uh, additional work services agreement, Valleywide Rec, and Parks. Uh, Robert? Yeah, thank you. Uh, this item is uh, for consideration of a recommendation to City Council on a potential additional work contract uh, with Valleywide uh, Recreation and Park District for maintenance and operation uh, of city-owned facilities that are on the uh, west side of the I-215, uh, including one on the east side, which is uh, uh, Rancho Ramona Park. So 
I, uh, just to highlight some of the history on this, um, as you all likely are aware, um, going back uh, into the previous fiscal year, there was a workshop uh, we held with the city council um, where both the city uh, and Valleywide presented uh, operational plans uh, for the city-owned facilities um, as the city was not renewing its contract with EDA uh, to operate and maintain those same parks. Um, and uh, as a result, city council uh, elected to uh, uh, select Valleywide to do that maintenance and operation. Um, at the time, uh, there was an assumption that the uh, comparison of services from the city's proposal and from Valleywide's was an apples to apples comparison. Uh, upon uh, entering into the contract and doing, actually getting boots on the ground, um, several things have come into disrepair just from basic use. Uh, some things were deferred from prior years, um, uh, but uh, Valley White has informed city staff that many of the uh, addressing many of those items um, exceeds what their uh, their concept of the contract was to entail. So, uh, as a result, um, uh, they had provided us with uh, estimates on what it would be to address those deferred maintenance issues. Some of them are just routine maintenance issues, but uh, aren't included in the base contract. So what's before you tonight um, is a uh, contract uh, for uh, up to $100,000 for uh, per year uh, as a side contract. So this is not an amendment to their existing contract, but a side contract uh, to perform those additional services as needed. Um, this can be anything from uh, graffiti abatement uh, to replacement of sprinkler heads or repair of lateral lines. Uh, prepping, prepping of uh, picnic uh, shelters for rentals. Um, within the staff report, there is a abbreviated list of those items. Um, and then, it, of course, attached to uh, the staff report is the uh, contract in full. And at the rear of that is an exhibit that lists their rate sheet uh, for each of the disciplines, the uh, work disciplines associated with the mostly maintenance. There isn't really any additional programming. Uh, costs, it's just maintenance costs um, for your consideration. So um, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back to you for discussion and um, whatever the will uh, or the recommendation of the, the commission is. Uh, I just have one question. In every commission I've ever been on, when you have a contract such as this, don't you send it out for uh, don't you send an RFP out for bid? Yeah, typically that is what happens. With the base contract, the city council um, made a decision to award it um, or directed staff to negotiate and then execute it um, uh, without doing that process. And so uh, part of our due diligence is to, to uh, bring that back to council with the same vendor, same contractor, proposed, um, but it is still up to council whether they want to award it to the same one or put out the bid. So as you'll note in the staff report, uh, toward the end, I believe just before the fiscal impact section, there is uh, alternative proposed. Uh, you can also uh, recommend that uh, each of the disciplines be bid out as an, uh, as an on as needed basis, uh, as an on-call service. So that is an option as well. Okay, people. Go ahead, Tom. It seems to me that we ought to recommend to the council that they look at all their options. Uh, it's a fiscal responsibility that they have, and that is not to just go to one source and say, okay, I accept. We really need to compare prices. My point of view. Anyway, uh, Rick? Um, yeah, I, I'm in definite agreement with that. I mean, I remember the the whole discussions that happened over several months and uh, it just seems to me it was rushed a little bit uh, I think uh, and to no fault of anybody's I think it was a, um, it, it should have it should have taken more time basically because it's a big job it's a it's a huge job and I think Dean and everybody would agree with me it, it should have been a little more m microscopically looked at um, uh, I I do agree that uh, that uh, it, it should be those options should be available to the council, um, and if 
my thinking on this is if we do suggest the, to the council that we really uh, look at the expenses on a, either a, a, a quarterly or a semi-annual basis to make sure, hey, is that $100,000 being well spent or you know, it, it's up to $100,000. It doesn't mean it's going to be $100,000. Um, if we're three months into it and we're at $75,000, Houston, we got a problem. Just yes, Robert. Sure. Point of point of clarification as well. Uh, some things can um, impact the costs uh, that are not foreseen. So inclement weather. If we have a you know a ten year flood event, you know those things can tend to affect or impact the price. Um, instead of having them maintain a uh, a basin area in a park, you know once a month they may have a big we may have a catastrophic event where we're going to need to pay them more to do more work. Uh, so 100000 is really, in our view, conservative because we don't know what could happen. Yeah, uh, technically it could be anything. Uh, but uh, I, I also agree that I think we should look at all options before we settle on any particular company. Uh, Valleywide may be the best one to go with because they're there already. I don't know. But uh, certainly we should look at it to see. Uh, at least that's my opinion. Anybody else? Well, we're going to do questions of staff and then take public comment. And then yeah, we're going to have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Are there any further questions of staff? Hearing none, I'm going to open the public hearing um, and uh, ask our city clerk mm -hmm. if um, there are any Anybody wants to speak on Ch this matter? Chair, Chair, um, Chair Rosen, it's actually not a public hearing. It's just a considerations, but your public public comment can be taken. Yes. Okay. Co public comment. Is, uh, has anyone requested uh, the option of speaking? Yes, we have one speaker, Dean Wetter. Dean, would you please come to the podium? I would like to do is just to touch base in regards to uh, this request. Um, a little history in regards to um, there is no specific project involved with this, uh, with the um, uh, with the requested additional work. This is simply an allocation, and so the one hundred thousand dollars I think is appropriate to have an appropriation because there are some unknowns out there with the park system. But this simply is an allocation for the unforeseen problems or things that aren't typically or you're not typically able to foresee or forecast. Some of that has to do with irrigation components, some of it has to do with vandalism. And so some of that or parts of what the components that are built into that and the unknowns uh, we handle as a park district through uh, basically a time and material basis where the uh, labor classification is paid by the hour and then the parts are billed at a cost plus a um, nominal markup. And so that's kind of how we handle our, our 1,000 uh, acres of parks that we have throughout our system covering 800 square miles. And to my knowledge, those prices have been all extended to the city uh, through, uh, through our valley-wide existing contracts. So this is kind of a, a formal way of saying we can do the same thing that we do with, throughout our entire park system uh, with the system that we're doing here on Menifee. Some of the advantages of that really is the economies of scale and the availability of manpower to jump on small things. These wouldn't be complete rehabilitations. Of course, Robert and I would agree that that would be something that would be bid out as a large-scale project. These are things that if you have a pump that goes bad or you have a controller that needs to be replaced or there's a fence that's knocked down because of a car accident, we're able through this financing mechanism to respond very quickly for the residents of Menifee. So I just wanted to clarify, I don't know that that's, it's a difficult concept and it's complicated, but what we have existing with the city of Menifee is a partnership. The partnership 
that's included in the landscaping is really the routine part of it. The uncontrolled parts are the things that we're talking about and addressing through an additional uh, extra work contract that's presented to you today. So our recommendation would be it would be nice if the commission would recommend to the council to consider um, the uh, valley-wide portion of that contract. I'm here also to answer any questions. Uh, yes, Bill. Uh, thank you. So, Mr. Wetter, the original contract, it was very comprehensive, had an awful lot of uh, tasks. And so these new items that are here, were they unforeseen? Uh, did they just get uh, eliminated or, or omitted in the original contract? Or how did we get to the point where the first contract didn't include these items? Sure. The, if you would imagine that the, f the first proposal to the city um, through our process of the workshop was to provide um, essentially how we do it. So there's, uh, there's personnel costs, there's facility costs for special events, and then there's landscaping costs. Those landscaping costs are essentially extended the same way that we do our entire park system, which is a per square foot basis for the routine services. And so the extra par portion of it or the supplemental extra work of what you're looking at today is an allocation for repairs. And so I kind of alluded to, because it's so difficult to explain, is if I had a lawn service come to my house on a weekly basis, I'd probably pay them, what, $50 a month to do the four services. Um, however, when it comes to if I need a controller box replaced or something, I'm going to have to have a discussion with him to replace that certainly not within the fifty dollars. <clears throat> I'm going to want to have control over to make sure that number one, I know about the problem that's being fixed and I've approved it afterward and that's why we have a very elaborate inspection system built into uh, our park system. We have two full-time inspectors and that's what they do. And they, they, they witness and they document the repairs that are needed and they also witness and document and sign off that the repairs have been completed. And so those are the two functions that are built into that. They also know the time that's spent on it. And so through our system, our economies of scale, we have a good benchmark for what types of repairs take as far as time-wise and material-wise. And so we can use that for the advantage and cost savings to the city of Menifee. So when you prepared that original um, proposal, did you have a copy of the city's proposal or what they were talking about? Uh, would be part of their comprehensive package did it and did the city's proposal include things like graffiti abatement or uh, irrigation repair and things like that well to my knowledge the city was in the process of uh, through an RFP process for landscape maintenance so it it was difficult to know exactly what they what that those particular items were okay a lot of this in my opinion it may be our fault that we you know professionally we have a we have a fiduciary responsibility to our taxpayers and decisions about who we award contracts to have to be done responsibly and I think the right way to do it is to put out an RFP and have a competitive bidding process. So the fact that we didn't do that puts us and creates opportunities or creates uh, situations like this. So uh, I think it's kind of a it's, a, it's a disappointment I guess looking from the outside. So that's just my opinion on it. Yeah, and if I can just res uh, add a little addition to that. For instance, uh, we had some rain events uh, through the first month of our contract. Uh, we've, we've discovered some irrigation issues. There's some 3,000 sprinkler heads and 300 valves uh, out through the system. So we've identified some weaknesses. And uh, those weaknesses uh, through the system of just operating it for the first month have surfaced. And now those aren't something that you would expect every month, but the total of, the, of what those are those invoices are less than three thousand dollars for the first month so knock on wood if things go well and continue that way and we don't have any uh, uh, extravagant disaster or burst of vandalism we can expect the true cost at the end of the day to be very low um, it's nice to have an allocation because then the the uh, the financing mechanism of going to council for appropriations, which I believe was what Mr. Lennox is uh, accomplishing with this, recommenda or this recommendation, is to allow for an allocation. The audit and the actual numbers are a case-by-case -case basis, and they're not only audited by us, but they're submitted to the city before and after the repairs are done. So very tight fiscal control on this. And it is also the same pricing uh, that we get from our economies of scale of having a large park district. 
I appreciate you. Shed some light. I appreciate you answering those questions. I know they're a little bit uh, pointed. Uh, finally, if we have, if I if I understand it right, there is a contract that it's renewable annually, and so as we come into the the next fiscal, whenever the period is when we renew, would these new items be built into the future uh, annual update? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, the, the way this additional work contract is structured is similar to the base contract. It does have the option for renewal, and there's a maximum of three years, so we could re-examine at the end of the fiscal if we needed to. But it's renewable yearly? Yes, annually, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Tom. Question for Robert. The funds that are listed in here, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about what they are? I see them by CSA 33, for example. What is that? So uh, the CSAs and CFDs uh, that are listed there are special tax districts. They each cover a specific geographic area in the city. Um, so the CSAs are traditionally the older ones that were adopted uh, from this, the county when the city was incorporated. Um, the biggest being CSA 145, and that incorporates almost almost all of the parks. Uh, the newer ones, uh, and 33, CSA 33. The newer ones are the CFDs, uh, one of which includes the Audie Murphy Ranch Sports Park, uh, and then of course the right of way uh, landscaping that's part of that also. Um, and then of course there's general fund, uh, which supports some of the, um, the open space, landscaped open space uh, within the city. Um, that's there. Now, if you're looking for a breakdown of which parks and amenities fall within each one, we can certainly provide that to you. No, I don't need that. I was just thinking forward. Let's say, okay, that's good for one year. There's 100000 Would the money be there for the following year out of those same funds? Right. Um, that's a, that's a, there's a complex answer to that. Um, for the special tax districts, as, of course, those are, are essentially uh, reimbursed each year through the collection of the, uh, the assessments from the property. Uh, property uh, tax bills. Um, some of the fund balances in those are more healthy than others. For example, the CFD for Audie Murphy Ranch Sports Park, um, because it was collecting well before the park was opened, uh, there's a significant fund balance to accommodate that. Uh, whereas CSA 145, uh, an older CSA, uh, older tax district that had been around, has been used uh, over a number of years uh, to maintain these spaces, its fund balance is not as healthy. Uh, and so during our maintenance of this through the contract with Valleywide, we're trying to find ways to reduce costs overall. So that could be changing the type of irrigation, which we're currently doing over at Lyle Marsh and E.L. Peterson Park. Uh, so that way there's less expenses against that CSA during the year. So the following year we can start to we can start to realize some savings, exactly. Okay. Thank you for that. Any further comments? Sir Chair, may I address one comment that uh, Commissioner Zimmerman had? Go right ahead. I think that uh, it's important as a foundation to know that this contract, even though there's an allocation, that this contract is not, it's not funds that get transferred to Valleywide without any work being done. In other <coughs> words, uh, Valleywide is, not may, uh, is not in the business of profit. There's no profit bid in, built into any of, our, uh, any of our structure or support. So this is an allocation for some unknown factors that could be based on things that are out of our control, as Mr. Lennox had uh, stated earlier. But there is no profit there, and there is no expectation to keep any of that money if it's not used. It's our job to keep costs down, and I like to use the term of our job is not to bleed our partner agencies. Our job is to come back at the end of the year and say, we saved even more than we thought we could. And we've had that experience uh, with the other cities that we've served as well, is to be able to come back and say, you know, we came to you with a contract price. We're proud to say we beat our own contract price, and so you reap the savings. And so that's, that's where we're at. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Robert, what is it that we need to do? A recommendation to the City Council? That, that would be preferred, uh, although the Commission can also elect to leave it alone and uh, we can present it as you see it here, we can present it to Council that way. It's up to you. Gentlemen, what's your pleasure? 
Well, That's I, right. I think there's, uh, it sounds to me like there's consensus and um, I would certainly hope that that would come true from what Mr. Wetter said. And it I might, think, you know, it yeah, might. It's uh, just, absolutely. it's an unknown. But I, w I would say yeah. that I, I believe that uh, the prudent thing to do would make a recommendation to put it out for bid um, and go from there. And all I can say to Mr. Dean is if it happens, get ready to put the discount hat on. <laughs> That's all. Are you prepared to make a, 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 I would, a, a motion? Yeah, I would, I would, uh, I would uh, make a motion that we uh, recommend to the city recommend council. the city council to uh, put this out to bid and uh, that's for the uh, additional work. Uh, I have a motion, so I need a second. Uh, I'll second. Uh, Tom has seconded it, and now discussion. Yes, Robert. Just something to add another layer is there are some uh, maintenance issues that are more urgent um, that we've seen in the field uh, through Dean's staff. Uh, in the, independent of what happens with the additional work contract, um, if there uh, could be some consideration by the commission and then by council to, uh, let's say, f for example, if the council does not award it to Valleywide, um, Valley White is on the ground now. If we can use them to address some of those immediate needs at a nominal cost, um, not entering into a contract, but to do project specific piece by piece. Exactly. Uh, I absolutely and, agree with that. Until the bidding process is done. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. I think we agree on that as well. Well, uh, any further discussion about the motion? Should Robert's remarks be incorporated into the motion? Uh, yes. Uh, Rick, would it be okay to yeah. modify the motion? Would yeah. you please modify the motion to include uh, the statement made by Robert, namely that if there are emergency issues uh, that come up prior to any such uh, giving of a contract, that uh, staff has the ability to hire whom they wish to, to do the job that's needed immediately. Now, not hearing any other, uh, any other information being given by our people, can we call the, me, uh, the motion? Uh, all in favor? Uh, oh, uh, should we, we should have a, a roll call vote. Margarita, please. And before, before you do that, should I refer to you as our clerk or Margarita? Sure, either one. <laughs> okay. OK, so for a roll call uh, vote, Chair Rosen? Uh, uh, yes. Vice Chair Zimmerman? Yes. Um, Commissioner Gaunt? Yes. Commissioner Croy? Yes. And Commissioner Gidroyce? Yes. All right, um, unanimously, we're going to recommend to the city council that they send this out for bid and then choose accordingly. Okay, that brings us to item 8.4, park rules and safety signage. And again, I go back to Robert. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Alan Young. You'll present the item. Welcome to the group, Alan. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, commissioners and staff, I'll be providing a brief uh, presentation on the city park rules and sa safety signage for the city parks. These are two samples of, uh, these are the city park rules and regulations that we'll be installing uh, at the new city parks, uh, replacing the county uh, park signs. And we have one dog park, E.L. Peterson Park, that was, this sign was uh, designed specifically for just that park. Next, we have the athletic field and picnic shelter rental signs. Uh, these are for uh, AMR Sports Park, La Ladera Park, uh, for athletic field use. And then also, since we have picnic shelters throughout the, our park system, uh, we'll be uh, installing picnic shelter use uh, signs uh, showing uh, for reservations of that sort. And the next slides we have are uh, 
each park. Uh, these are the proposed uh, sign locations. And uh, we can go one by one, or you guys can just quickly uh, or look through them and uh, provide suggestions. Uh, basically, the park signs, uh, we're not going to try to install any new poles or anything. We'll be installing on either street light poles or park light poles to keep it clean. So, ba so basically for ELP Peterson Park, uh, the park rule signs are denoted as red circles. Uh, basically, I have one at each entrance into the park. Uh, the green circles denote uh, picnic shelter reservation signs. There are uh, two picnic shelters at that park. And then we also have uh, the black circles are the dog park rule signs. And there's only, there is a small dog park and a big dog park uh, on the very north side of the park. But there's a, uh, one location where you can see the signs from. May yeah, I just ask one question now? Mm -hmm. uh, are the large and small dog parks separated from each other? Yes. By a fence? Yes. Yeah. There's two different gates. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, we have uh, La Ladera Park. Uh, this one, uh, also, we have. Uh, I proposed uh, four locations for the park rule signs, three at uh, entrances and one at the parking lot. Uh, this has uh, two picnic shelters, so there's two green circles. And also, since this has a multi-use uh, baseball field and soccer field, uh, proposed to, uh, proposing to install a fence care sign. But what does that mean? Uh, not to mess with the fence, oh. basically. <laughs> To, to be specific, uh, what typically occurs in the industry is the users, uh, kids mostly, like to throw their baseballs or kick their soccer balls or even lean against those fences. And as a result, you get a nice bowing effect. Yeah. And sometimes the fence even itself leans. Okay. No pepper. Next, we have uh, Lazy Creek Park. This one uh, just proposed three park signs. There's no picnic shelters at this park. Okay. Lau Marsh Park, uh, also just proposing three park signs, and a uh, park row signs, and there's two picnic shelters, so two picnic shelter signs. I would also add to this one, uh, and it's not represented on here, this is a multi-purpose field as well and reservable, so we would likely also be adding the field reservation sign here. Next, we have Nova Park. This one also uh, proposed three park rule signs. And uh, noting what uh, uh, Director Lennox said, this one is also used for soccer use. So uh, proposed uh, park uh, athletic field use sign, too. And then next, we have Rancho Ramona Park. And this one, I'm proposing three park rule signs. And there's three picking shelters, so three picnic shelter signs. And that completes my presentation. Thank you. Yes, Rick. Yeah, I just have a, a quick question. Um, the signs, do they have, I didn't see it only because it's pretty small print. Do they have the uh, email address and the phone number for the reservation system on there? Let me go back to the slide and I'll show you. Uh, which one in particular, sir? Uh, either one of them. Oh. Yes, uh, we have Valley Wise phone number and the City Menifee's okay. phone number. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, personally, I think you've got it covered. I don't see any need to change anything. Anybody else? I mean, uh, you, I think it's very well done, Alan. Thank you. We wanted to make sure we brought this to the commission. It was one of the action items on the strategic plan that, that we did at the special meeting. So we want to ensure you guys do get a chance to see these. Right. There's nothing for us to do, really, with this except say thank you. Um, that brings us to 8.5.
examined the Cimarron Ridge 10 acre park site. At what stage is this park in? This is at the fourth review of the tentative track map. So it has not fully recorded, although at the fourth review, uh, the layout of the uh, proposed track is pretty, it's pretty set. Um, but again, as a result of the, the strategy meeting workshop that we had, uh, commission did want to review this um, to see what, what is planned. Um, the intent is to come back though with a conceptual design uh, for the, the commission to provide further input on. Um, this is again a 10 acre park, it's a pretty significant space. Um, and uh, in talking personally with the developer, there's some pretty good plans for the space. Um, apparently this had, it, before my time, this track map had gone through a number of revisions uh, earliest iteration of it included actually uh, I think three different um, parks within the, the track development and uh, it, it was segmented so somehow um, without my presence or, or community services staff presence it evolved into a single contiguous park which is preferred. And, and as you see on this this track map, there isn't any designation yet uh, for parking. Um, so it's something we'll be taking into account because 10 acres is, is significant enough. Audie Murphy Ranch Park is 11.29 acres. So the goal will be to ensure there's, signif there's ample parking, um, preferably as far away from the residential zones as possible. Uh, and I think that n the north bordering road there, uh, Margarita can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, um, we can probably, there we go. Yeah, McLaughlin Boulevard. So um, there's some, that's, that's a larger arterial compared to some of the residential interior streets. So our, our plan will be to uh, try to focus the parking to the north side. I think the commission was interested in trying to see what it was that was put into the park um, in association with what we think we need for the city uh, or if we're going to have something unique here I don't know if that's even possible uh, I mean we've talked about water features and things of that nature um, at this stage I don't know if it's possible to change any of whatever it was that they were thinking of doing. Um, I mean, for all I care, could we flood it and turn it into a lake? <laughs> I, I don't know if we can go to that extreme, <laughs> but, but, you know what I mean? but just... uh, to address your question, we're, we are uh, early enough in the process that the commission as well as staff can provide input on what amenities go there. Really what you guys are reviewing right now is the footprint, the layout. Uh, it can come later at the conceptual review. Um, and, and so for that reason, this typically uh, rectangular or square layouts that have high acreage are ideal because you can do more with them. Um, aesthetically, um, they sometimes can be harder to design just because, you know, people like things other than squares. Uh, but for the most part, this is, this is a, a good situation. Rick? <clears throat> um, in, in looking at the map here, <clears throat> once again, those Edison corridors right on the other side of the street. Right. Uh, uh, my thinking on this one is preserve as much possible space, um, maybe have it tie in to that Edison corridor as a, as a park and you get suddenly your 10 acre park becomes a 50 acre park. And you talk about, and, and what, fr what I hear from, from people all the time, soccer fields, soccer fields, soccer fields, and more soccer fields. We need as and many parking. as we can get. You could even put parking on the other well, side. And, and you have an opportunity here, number one, to get the parking situation correct. But I think it's, it, it'd be an, a, an interesting concept to m morph those two areas together so that you could maybe take advantage of some of that Edison corridor and, and make a ginormous park. 
just an idea. Please. Okay. So there, there will be uh, at future meetings opportunities to sort of prioritize what uh, park development the city um, would like to pursue as priority, you know, as a top priority. Because uh, if Edison does uh, respond positively to the inquiry, um, you'll have that option. You'll have other city property that we own outright uh, as possible park improvement zones or areas like the 20 acres down near the high school. Uh, and so there's only so much, uh, so much currently in our fund balance, uh, either through collection of Quimby fees or through our DIF to address those, but we're also gonna be looking at grant funds uh, to leverage that and maximize um, what we can do to develop new park space uh, that's not uh, developer built. And uh, I mean, we should keep in mind that uh, just because we've decided we want to put a specific item in a certain area doesn't mean we're going to do it now. Yeah, it might take who knows what number of years to do, but as long as we conceptualize what it should be. And I agree. I mean, we should take advantage of that utility corridor. All right. I mean, 300 feet of utility corridor by I don't know how many miles uh, all open for us to use. So, oh, Edison isn't going to care as long as we don't put a big structure up. That's all. What? Uh, yes. Yes, Ken. Right here. Um, another quick question. Do we, what, what is the ultimate width of McLaughlin? Is it a two lane? Is it, do we know? I, I don't know that. I'll have to take a closer look. Yeah, that'd be, a, that'd be another. Well, we may need to put some kind of overpass or some way for people to cut across. Walking bridge. A walking bridge, fine. But I mean, something, if they park on the other side, they're going to have to be able to get across the um, highway without becoming uh, billiard balls in the yeah. game. All right. Thank you. And oh, I'm sorry. You're not lit up. He turned it off. Oh. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. That's all right. Now you can hear me. Uh, the fact that it's so far north in that development, obviously the park should be there for the folks who are going to live in this future development. I, I really like the idea that the Edison Corridor could be tied into it or possibly at least be near it so those folks don't have to hike a great distance to get to use a park that's for their neighborhood. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, it's it's a nice spot for the park. It looks like it's level and it's all been set up close to McLaughlin, which you're, I agree, it's good for parking. But when I look, it's a lot of homes are going to be south of that. And I think it's important that the folks there should have access without having to make a, a big affair out of getting to their park. It's unfortunate that Roma Land, for whatever reason, doesn't have any park. Yeah, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> In, in what you're saying there, I think, because we really don't see it in this particular iteration of the detail, maybe it might be a suggestion to those property owners on the south end to create some hiking trails up to the park. I don't know if that's... Yeah, the, the full exhibit, and Margaret, if you can go back, uh, I think, while it's a little hard to see in that one, maybe go in the next one. Uh, this obviously is as a track map it's it's not going to highlight so much of the recreation features but there are trail uh improvements that are woven within here leading to the park. leading up to the park yes wonderful um and then along the perimeter of the track itself is all landscaped parkway um which are all to be part of what's annexed into the citywide cfd that will maintain the park space excellent would it be possible for us to um, ask this developer that when they get an idea of whatever it is they're thinking of for the park, that maybe they could show it to us? Yeah, the, the conceptual will come back to the commission and you'll have the opportunity to, to provide input. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Bill. Uh, is this our opportunity to, to give some input to them and give the direction of things we we are looking for before they go to pencil and paper on it? We can, absolutely, you can. Um, with that in mind, one thing we should consider, we, we all have seen that there's a public utility corridor on the other side of Laughlin, McLaughlin Road. There are limitations of things we can do 
in the public utility corridor. One of those things we can't do is build uh, standards for lights. So maybe we want to encourage this piece to have the things that you can't do, like a baseball diamond or something that would have light standards and things like that, so that you know we're not we don't have too much of the same. We're getting the kinds of things in this park that we can't do in the public utility corridor. So with that, should we have should we encourage a ball diamond or two to be put on this site? Yes. Yes, the typically a park of this size, uh, anything over five acres, we're going to be targeting as a sport with sports amenities. Um, and I think one of the disadvantages that we are at um, is we don't know the true full need of the city uh, when it comes to those. I mean, that's part of a community needs assessment um, that would still need to be done. Um, but at this point, our best guess is based off of our existing inventory. And as some of the commissioners mentioned this evening, soccer is one, um, baseball is another. I mean, the, they're, you know, they're, they're the popular ones, obviously. So it, It's tough to install lights for ball fields and ball diamonds in an existing neighborhood. You're going to get a lot of resistance from those neighbors, but it's not so easy when it's part of the design of the neighborhood and the new neighbors are coming in being told up front that it's there so you don't find a lot of resistance. So I would encourage some kind of lighting system, ball diamond, something that allows for night use. Good. Anything else? Good. Thank you, because we needed to see this. This is really very nice that we're getting that. All right, let's go to 8.6, the Town Center Central Park. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this item is for consideration of a conceptual design um, that uh, is part of the uh, what was formerly known as or was known as Regent Town Center and Menifee Town Center. Um, on the uh, screen is a vicinity map that shows just off of Newport on the south side um, along Town Center Drive. Once you approach what's the currently there is a roundabout with the old oak tree in the middle. Um, and you continue uh, easterly until it reaches that elbow. Uh, parcel 20 there is intended to be the future home of City Hall at some point down the road. Um, and adjacent to that in the red box is where this five acre park is proposed. Um, to give you a little bit of background, uh, it's been I think oh, um, maybe two months or a month since the City Council approved a development agreement amendment uh, which provided more detail not only about this particular park site, but um, other uh, development improvements within this, uh, this development as a whole. Um, and you've probably seen in many of the press releases what's been announced for movie theater and medical complex and other pieces. So um, this is uh, our first review, uh, in essence, the Commission's first review of the conceptual. Uh, go to the next slide. So on March 31st, the city had a chance to meet with uh, Regent Development uh, to kind of get an idea of what was planned for that five acre uh, area. Uh, this was the initial uh, plan, uh, including the amphitheater, some uh, uh, splash pad feature, uh, palm grove, restrooms, you know, shade, uh, picnic shade, shelter area, uh, and uh, obviously the audience area in a parking lot just to name a few of those things. But um, so staff had a chance to look at that um, and made some markup. If you can go to the next slide. And I know this is a little hard to make out um, and you don't have the backup, we can provide this. Essentially, and, and to summarize it, what we proposed was rotating the amphitheater area so that it faced a more uh, northwestern direction um, so that there wasn't an issue with sun in folks' eyes and it also uh, welcomed in anyone that was uh, parking in that lot as well as uh, coming over the, the proposed pedestrian bridge and they weren't coming into the back of an event, they were coming in, uh, you know, where the audience typically would come in. Uh, and then it also opened up uh, for folks who were enjoying features, other features of the park to still also enjoy 
whatever was on whatever production was on the amphitheater stage. So, um, so that's why it was rotated. Um, we wanted to also uh, shorten up the parking. This type of park is intended to be uh, a uh, accessible mostly by by bike or foot, uh, especially with the pedestrian bridge across uh, the channel. There's a significant amount of parking proposed in the uh, the rich development across the way. Uh, and then in the adjacent City Hall uh, uh, lot, there is also proposed a significant amount of parking in the future. So we didn't want to limit the, the amount of recreational use of this because of the adjacent parking opportunities that are down the road. Um, we also talked about uh, uh, trying to repurpose the proposed Palm Garden area into something that uh, has been discussed in the city before, which is public art. Um, there's a lot of active artists in this community, uh, and uh, one of the trends within uh, recreation and parks uh, lately is uh, displaying that art as uh, you know art in public spaces. And so, um, as a as a department, we are going to be going back to council and to commission at some point with a public art. Uh, a resolution to try to make it more official that uh, Menifee can be a uh, public art um, uh, community and, and that encourages that. And so we'd like to see something that helps display that maybe on a rotating basis, um, some art in this park. Um, uh, and then just sort of maximizing in general the, the overall this, um, boundaries of the park with some of the features that were already identified. So expanding the splash pad to the to the edge of the wa of the walking trail that goes around, uh, as well as some of the other. Uh, I believe there was a, a yeah, expanding uh, like B, expanding the top lot up all the way up so folks can benefit from more space. Um, and then possibly another restroom that's closer down uh, to the south end of the uh, uh, of the what was proposed as the palm area, palm grove area. So. This is what was proposed. Um, uh, this wasn't given in hard copy to uh, to the uh, con uh, the con contracted landscape architect at the time. Uh, what happened was staff met with uh, the developer and went over these. Um, and uh, right now, we're still considering some of these changes. So, what we have in the most recent revision, though, if you go to the next slide. Um, was an iteration of the first um, submittal to us from back in March. So this came uh, just this week. Um, some things, though, to point out, though, is it, it seems to have contracted a little bit and made smaller the amenities. Um, I think for the intent of what the city envisioned, we want to maximize this as a central meeting place for the entire city. So this is where we intended to see the future citywide special events held. Um, we want it to be really a crown jewel uh, of the city. This is a, a signature park. An, even at five acres, this is intended to be a signature park right in the middle of the Civic Center. Uh, and so you can go to the next slide. You can see kind of a comparison between what was originally submitted and what is being submitted now. Uh, I say this all knowing that we are still going to be sitting down um, with Regent to go over this, and I think they're amenable to uh, modifying this still. And I, I do see Nick from Regent here in the in the audience, and he I'm, I'm sure he can answer some questions if the commission has any. Um, but this is this is the general uh, concept um, with with some of the notes and comments that staff has submitted. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Gentlemen. Yeah, Tom. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. Ken. That's all right. I think it's outstanding. I really do. I think this is a outstanding project. You've done a great job. I'm looking forward to it. My biggest concern was, and I think you addressed it already, is future parking problems. And if those parking problems are going to be addressed and it's going to be People are going to be able to use the parking facilities around that. I don't know exactly where that is or, you know, how, the, how that's laid out. But if that parking, additional parking, is going to be within close proximity, then I'm all for it. I think it's great. Rick? I yeah, couldn't agree with Ken Moore. I, I, I really like your the turning that amphitheater around. It, it makes a lot of sense because if I'm not mistaken, Going south, I can imagine, because I've 
played on stages like this where at, if you're doing a concert at 6 o'clock in the evening, you're not going to see the audience, you're not going to see nothing unless you've got some big sunglasses on. So that's a, a technically, just from a, a, a aesthetics point, that's a, that's a great thing. Um, I do agree with you that um, that the palm idea, making that into a public arts thing and studying what's happening nationwide, uh, uh, there's a real push for public art displays and it, and it really adds to a, the, the cultural uh, richness of a community. It, you're seeing it where even Detroit and places like that are turning old park spaces into public uh, art and it's really enriching the neighborhoods and, and, and helping out with uh, with that. And I couldn't support that more. I think that's a fantastic idea. <clears throat> um, now, directly on the to the north of this, that's going to be the city hall site? Yeah, that's correct. Well, let me throw something out there. Get rid of all the parking. Make it all park. That is an option. It's walkable. Definitely walkable, and, and you know, of course, with ADA requirements, have the sidewalks and stuff, but why not make it all park? Because there are people who can't walk, uh, speaking, I have, no, I understand. and uh, therefore, you need to be able to at least get people who are, uh, who are challenged yeah. to get closer by car so they can do a little bit and not have to go over the bridge, and that's a considerable sure. amount yeah, of area. No, I understand. Anyway, um, Tom. This reminds me very much of the park that they have in the middle of LA, which kind of is in front of City Hall where there's waterfalls. It's obviously going to be an urban park in the future, and it's a great design. I like the modifications that you guys made. I did want to ask more about the amphitheater and how many folks you're thinking would be seated in front of it. I don't have a really good idea about scale. Ideally, we'd like a proposed amphitheater in this space, uh, including if it's turned and pointed up, with uh, including the, the hardscape area and sort of peripheral to be able to accommodate six to 7,000 people, um, if possible. Um, now, I'm not sure what, what was proposed in these two, and I, I know that Nick can probably speak to that or his consultant can speak to that, um, if they had done any calculations on that or if this is just really just a uh, you know, uh, sort of a napkin drawing of what it could be um, without the calcs, but um, we would like to see it be able to accommodate quite a bit of people in the future. There's quite a few. Yes. Are you suggesting uh, there aren't going to be any hard chairs put in? So we're talking about putting it on the grass? Yeah, and in fact, Margaret, if you can go back to the marked up version. So I know it's a little hard to tell on this, but essentially when rotating it, there was a option is to incorporate either hardscaped or DG um, strips within the middle of that um, and it's just segmented with turf areas. Uh, but yeah, the intent is for, for people who are coming to enjoy an event to bring their chairs uh, or to be a standing room only type of event, one or the other. Thank you. And so when not in use, that could be where you throw your Frisbee. Exactly. Now, there is intended to be some a, a slight slope to the area just to provide a better view from those who are sitting in the back. Um, but, yeah, it can still be used for, for somewhat passive recreation when there's no production going on. Well, with the number of people you've mentioned, parking certainly would be a concern. And the parking lot I see doesn't look like it would be in any way to the scale of the number of folks that we're talking about having to... Uh, would be seated, yellow seated there. Oh. Yellow. No, I'm yellow. I was on. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't close enough to the mic. So and looking at the parking, it is, I don't think to scale compared to the number of people you expect would be using the amphitheater. So uh, we would have an issue there. Yeah, it, it, it does pose that challenge, and that's why the adjacent lots become so important. Um, I think that the goal here is to envision and plan for the the maximum growth of the of the area and use of the civic space uh, and inviting people in to be more connected with their government um, and you can see places like uh, Temecula that have done this effectively you know placing somewhat of an outdoor venue in front of their city hall same concept um, they have not incorporated significant parking around that by by intention uh, and so what they do is have a lot of these peripheral lots um, and their challenge is more of a build-out challenge, but they do have these peripheral lots, and so when they have the event, 
Uh, they close the streets, um, and, and essentially people just walk into the site. Um, and that, that's really the spirit of this. Um, and, and another benefit of rotating the amphitheater this way and maximizing the space is you're pointing it away from what, where, the in, where the future residential area is, is planned. So it doesn't show it here. Actually, Marguerite, you can go back to the vicinity map. If you look up at like, uh, you know, P6 and to the left, which would be Southmore, this is some of the residential areas that are planned, uh, proposed. But uh, look, I see, I see Nick getting up. He may have some things to add on this too. So we knew he, we knew he couldn't stay. Yeah, happy to hear from you. Go ahead. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for for going through this, and I, I just want to say a few of things. I think from the from the amphitheater standpoint, it's not it's not an arbitrary thing that it's turned that way. The site's relatively flat. In fact, it's very flat. And the site drains to the wash. And in rotating the amphitheater the way that makes probably the most sense, the site, the site doesn't drain. So we had, we rotate it in a way that if it's going to be slanted, there's, there's an outlet to the wash. So as you see where the bridge is, where the pedestrian bridge is, there's an outlet to the Paloma wash. We have it set up that way that the site would drain and it would outlet to the Paloma Wash. We had it in, in concept before we had it the other way, but our civil engineer basically was having a hard time making the site drain. We, we can explore rotating this around, but it's not, but this is not a space for, I mean, for 7,000 people, maybe in many, many, many years. but. One of the other things that I wanted, wanted to bring up, one of the things that we're doing here is through the development, through, through the agreement that, that was reached, is that this park is being built first. Just like we've gone out there and we built Town Center Drive and the oak tree is in and the roads are being brought in, what we're doing different here is we are constructing this park. Uh, it's going to be constructed before there's one house out there. So our push is to have a park built out with, with a, with saddling it in a place that it can be, they can be built out around it. So the homes will come, homes will have a place to go. City Hall will be there, will be there someday. And we're also on, you know, on an actual budget that we're building this with. So I know there's a lot of things that, that are mentioned that are, would be very nice to have, but we, the plan that we are proposing is something that is what was, approved with city council we look at some of the things that that are recommended and see and see what what we can do to accommodate some of those and maybe i can have mr baxter miller come in and describe those things in a little better better detail of what we can do and what the relationships of some of these you know some of these uh, splash pads and top lots and things are <coughs> Hello, my name is Baxter Miller. I'm the landscape architect on the project. Um, as mentioned before, the uh, site plan was essentially uh, designed to be a kind of an urban park, knowing the, the level of de development around it, taking care of the uh, topography issues. The elevation of the um, stage is set so that when the highest flood level in the uh, channel goes, it will not back up into the park. Uh, we have a problem when, when you create a depression, uh, you run, run a risk of having it become a detention basin. We didn't want that to happen. Um, so also in the uh, design philosophy that I, I follow as it relates to amphitheaters is that you want the, the performers' faces to the sun and the audience to look away from the sun so they can see what's going on on the stage and that kind of activity, which presents an issue as it relates to uh, noise going back out to the community as opposed to going back towards the uh, city hall. But we had the additional problem of having topography work against us since it all kind of drains that direction to the north. Um, we had to put our stage at that end. It just became a technical issue that we had to deal with. We are creating mounds as opposed to this thing is going to be about, I think about five, six feet down below the natural grade, but we're elevating the backside of it with a berm, so you have a backdrop of trees and plant material, so you have a great view when you're looking, as an audience, looking towards the stage, 
And then in the back of it, we're putting a, uh, a berm as well. So we're kind of pushing it down, raising it in the back and raising it in the front. So we get a slope of about uh, five to one. So you have a nice slope that comes down. One thing that uh, taken into consideration in terms of area, uh, we have a uh, half acre lawn area in Corona where I, I reside and we have an annual concert series and it holds about 400, 500 people in a half acre. Um, and so that's an area of 100 feet deep essentially by 208 feet wide. This area is approximately about that size. So you might be able to get on a good concert with people who are willing to sit close together, maybe a thousand people. But the whole park in terms of how it's going to be used, in terms of, we have, a, if you'll notice, we have a large paved area that's intended so that you're going to have easy ups and all kinds of food vendors and things like that for those kinds of events. Uh, we set the restroom up at the uh, hot lot splash pad area for two technical reasons. One is that um, you want to have, for children, you want to have that restroom close to where they're going to be adjacent to water, uh, also the playground area. Um, five acre parks uh, oftentimes, uh, most often, uh, have limited restroom facilities, oftentimes limited uh, parking. Uh, the, the rule of thumb is about 100, uh, one acre of parking for every 10 acres of park, typically. Um, and you have a five acre park, and that usually yields about 100 parking spaces. And this park, this park is uh, parked with about 50 parking spaces, plus or minus. Uh, based on that rule of thumb. You can go with less, but you've noticed with the park that you already have uh, at Audie Murphy that uh, having less parking is, is worse than having uh, more parking than you really need. Because you could use the parking for staging. You could use the additional asphalt for, uh, as you set up these events and activities, for portable restrooms. You could use, uh, use that parking space for other kinds of activities as you're setting up for the, the <coughs> urban opportunities. Um, one thing to take into consideration as it relates to um, the overall space is that you're going to, we're designing this amphitheater so that you can have a variety of activities, whether it's a dance recital on a Saturday morning uh, or it's, it can be a concert, for example. We're anticipating that most of the equipment that you're going to be using for the stage setup is going to be rented, brought in, erected, uh, and then taken away f for two reasons. One is that that, that kind of equipment and that kind of setup for a, a kind of a fixed stage is incredibly expensive. We're doing an amphitheater in Fontana right now, and the uh, it's an it's an area of an acre it's an acre size, and the staging structure itself is about three million dollars. And because they wanted to have a real performance place, they could have graduations, do a number of different things, um, and they had a limited grading opportunity as well. Um, and also the shade structure we're putting over this thing because they decided they wanted to have a multi-purpose type of amphitheater space that they could use all year round and Fontana has uh, terrible summer weather as well. Uh, but that shade structure is two million dollars to cover this thing. Uh, we put in a shade structure in Buena Park for a, a staging area, uh, a small theater area uh, used as an amphitheater as, as well. Um, it's 80 by 80 and that thing cost nine hundred thousand dollars to install. So shade structures, uh, very, very necessary, very, very important, but can add to a, a, a balance line of the project. Not only that, but they have a life of about 15 to 30 years in terms of the fabric, depends on what, how much money you want to spend on it. Um, and you have that reoccurring cost after the 15 to 30 years. We did a uh, very large shade structure down in uh, Corona, down at um, El Cerrito Park, and it has a tensile fabric that was used, similar to what was used at the uh, airport in Denver, which is, has a 30-year, non-flammable, uh, fully weather-rated um, material. It has a 30-year uh, life of it, but they're going to have to replace it after 30 years, and that's going to be an expense that uh, no doubt nobody's saving for today. Um, what I like about this particular pro project is that we're putting so much intensity into a five-acre park. This is the kind of intensity we would put into a 10-acre park or a 15-acre park. We've done a number of uh, sports parks with these kinds of activities uh, at 30 and 40 acres in size. Um, the rule of thumb uh, as it relates to budgets, uh, five acre parks have about a quarter million dollars per acre value uh, designed in it. This thing, um, uh, as, as it's envisioned, uh, especially with the, with, the, with the changes, is going to be substantially larger than that. 
Um, and so we have a budget we have to deal with, we have activities, and certainly this park can grow and change over time, especially if it's a really strong urban park where a lot of people uh, use it, especially with art and, and changing out the art, how that's done, how that's protected, how, how you, you create these kind of uh, very flexible spaces. You know, I can imagine the, uh, these, these large decomposed granite areas of palm trees could be areas of, uh, you could have contemplation opportunities, benches and all kinds of things that go in there in addition to art. The art can be placed anywhere. We have, uh, can be placed out on those paving areas. The challenge is lighting it, the challenge is protecting it, um, and so uh, those are the kinds of things that have to be addressed. Um, we're not providing any kind of permanent stage lighting at the amphitheater because you never know what you're going to need. It's better to just bring in the, uh, the frames, set it up, have temporary power, and do whatever it is that you're going to do because you don't really want to spend that kind of money to either replace, repair, vandalism is always an issue when you have a lot of fixed lighting conditions. If you go out to Redlands and the Redland Bull, all they have is simple poles and they augment that with uh, frames and structures as they need it. Um, so that's kind of a summary of where we're going with this, with this <coughs> park space. Uh, our biggest issue is topography. It's flat as a tabletop. It's going to be difficult to drain. Uh, it's so close to the elevation of the uh, channel that we run, we really have to avoid what we normally would do is change the topography. Uh, but since it's really flat, we don't have a lot of extra dirt. And the thing will flood if it goes above high tide line uh, of the channel. So we really have to make sure that we're, when we design this thing, that it doesn't become a detention basin. So, answer any questions you may have. Um, yes, Bill. Thank you. Um, you said your name is Baxter Miller, right? Yes. Just to make sure I got the name right. Yes. Uh, Mr. Miller, thanks for the opportunity to have some comments. I, we're early in the stage, and this that's kind of the best opportunity, the best time to talk about it before you. We certainly don't want to be 11th hour saying, wait, wait a minute, we didn't want that. Um, right. It, and from my perspective, this is a civic park. It's mm -hmm. going to complement City Hall. It's going to be kind of the, the place um, that... I'm not so sure that a splash park and some of the things for tots and kids that you typically find at neighborhood parks, that this is the best location for that. I almost wonder if some of this space, and I'm concerned, I'm looking at this, if this is five acres, the amphitheater part's about uh, you know, maybe two of those acres, and to try to get as many people as we, as the, I believe that the city would like to have for our signature events where we get like uh, uh, Director Lennox said, five, six, seven thousand people. This design with the way it's laid out, I don't know if there's enough amphitheater space or public gathering okay. space. Um, and I'm wondering if it's okay to eliminate some of the things that are typically found at a neighborhood park. Um, the other thing is I'm wondering about the stage of for the amphitheater stage. So is, are you thinking it'd just be a concrete flat and nothing behind, not, like, you know, you think of, in my mind, I think amphitheater, I think Hollywood Bowl kind right. of thing. Right, Is there something, a structure that's behind? Well, what we've typically done, uh, we've done this for a 17-acre uh, park in Corona where we had, they, there was a desire to have a stage uh, element. And what we've done is cr essentially created a platform and then everything else will be done in drayage. You would come in and build the structure for whatever it is that you wanted to have, whether you wanted to have a shell shape, uh, just rent that material and bring it out because it, it, their biggest problem with amphitheaters, especially open amphitheaters, is the homeless, uh, inappropriate activities when you have those kinds of backdrops and whatnot. Okay. And so we try to leave it as open as possible um, and then and then provide for the, the, uh, the construction of what it is that you want to do. If it's a bluegrass band, it may be just curtains. If it's, if it's a orchestra, it may in fact be uh, some form of shape to, to direct music out uh, away from the space. And if you're having just uh, kids dancing <coughs> or you know some kind of ceremony, you may not want to have all that. With the backdrop of the hill, with the plant material and the trees and all that kind of stuff, may be ample for what you want to do. But we're having a real problem with uh, the unintended consequences of band shells and uh, structures for uh, amphitheaters, unless it's enclosed and, and locked up. Okay, thank you for that. Um, you, we talked, you talked a little bit about lighting. Mm -hmm. So I'm not talking about stage lighting right. now. I'm talking about, let's say, the end of the show ends, 
and the, and you see usually call it house lights right. so people can at least see their way as they're trying to work their way to their vehicle or whatever. Will there be uh, light standards around right. the outsides of well, the Well, there'll be light standards on all the walkways. Uh, we're going to carry it to uh, whatever the minimum standards that you would like to have it be. Uh, the issue with house lighting is, is, well, first of all, we're moving towards LED lighting on virtually everything we're doing. Yeah. Um, we just did um, a house lighting condition using LED lights in, in Buena Park. And as long as you have the fixtures that can be dimmable, uh, then we can dim, for example, the light f features, light fixtures in the uh, amphitheater, for example. You'll want to still light areas that are not in the amphitheater, right. parking lot, around the restroom. But we can establish the lights in the amphitheater itself because we're going to have walkways. We have a, uh, the goal is to have people be able to take the wheelchairs down to the center of the sweet spot of the view of the, the amphitheater, and that's going to be lit. And we can have those dimmable. Yeah. And uh, that's not really a problem as long as we select fixtures that can be, uh, LED fixtures that can be dimmed. We have done it, and uh, the product's available. It's not yeah. any different price. You just have to wire it differently and have a, a, a place for the dimmer. Things like low bollards and things like that are also good because they're not going to compete lighting wise with what's happening on the stage they're just lighting the walkways and things like yeah that. I think we're gonna we try to avoid bollards for two reasons one is um, oftentimes we find them unless they're done very substantial they become a, a place that gets something that gets vandalized quite easily I have yet to run across very many really substantial bollards uh, what we found is that uh, either niche lighting uh, in walls or in, in some form of concrete feature. So when somebody skateboards against it or Johnny bangs his bike into it, it's just not going to loosen it up. Um, we, we have uh, found for long-term uh, maintenance purposes and uh, longevity of lifespan is that if we can get it 12 feet plus off the ground, in term, the kids can't hit it with their skateboards typically. Um, they can, of course, they're standing on their bike when they get, you know, there's a, always a methodology. You can get them up to the point where they're freeway lights, but uh, we try to avoid that. And then uh, the higher they are, the, the, the better, uh, in the uh, luminosity is better, and you get them further apart. Uh, but that's what we're going to deal with when we get to the next stage. As soon as we find out what you guys want to have in this particular park, sure. um, you know, eliminating uh, very expensive, both from a maintenance standpoint and an installation standpoint, splash pad. Um, we have a splash pad that we put into a park in Corona. It's a 20-acre park, and they inundate the park during the hot summer months. We, they literally take up every single parking space, and there's easy ups everywhere with people huddled around the splash pad, which would overwhelm your park. Uh, that was one of those things that was put in as being a desirable thing to have. Yeah. Uh, as a landscape architect, I have absolutely no problem with losing the splash pad. As a designer of parks, I have no problem with losing the splash pad. Um, we've done a number of parks with play areas that are, are conceptual play areas. There's sculptures, uh, things in the la landscape where we use the rubberized surfacing and you create these sculptures that kids can play on their creative play spaces. Yeah. Uh, and then you can eliminate the, the typical uh, playground where you're going to, you know, it's, it becomes Johnny's playground. And then at that point we can move the restrooms down closer to the amphitheater, um, take care of that. We can adjust the location of the amphitheater. The only thing we have to do is make sure that we have proper drainage. Uh, the size of the amphitheater is a proportion relationship to all those other elements. We still also have a, uh, in the park has to be, has to be included, which is up at the north end of it, um, is a, a very l relatively large water quality basin that is required to uh, treat the water before it goes into the channel. Um, and so we still, that's why that big green area is above the, uh, above the uh, tot lot and splash pad and all that kind of stuff is to allow for that uh, water quality basin. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's, there's flexibility in it. Uh, the key <coughs> is, to, is, the, is to get there because they're on a time uh, schedule about getting this in before the rest of the development goes in. Right. That's it would what normally occur in the end of the development. We'd have plenty of time. That's why I was saying I'm glad you're here early and not not right. having us make these kind of comments at the 11th hour that's going to really give everybody a bunch of heartburn. Uh, but again, my, my perspective at this point is a 30,000 foot elevation. What is what is this particular park serving and what kind of park it is? And in my perspective, it's simply a civic park that complements where City Hall is. And uh, to me, taught lots are the better place for splash parks and things like okay. that. So. Sounds fine. Yes, Rick. Um, in, in growing up in West LA, we had a we had a park 
in Culver City, Culver City Park, that, that had a an, an amphitheater, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think that uh, this needs to be a destination point, and this needs to be a, a place where we could have a even a monthly event, uh, arts council, you know that type of thing, and. Uh, and I, don't, I think there's a lot of need for venues for musicians to play. There's a lot of bands out there that love to play places, and, and I'm hearing, at least, that there's just not that many places left for, like, mid-level bands to go play, people that have, you know, good people that you and I would know. Um, uh, but uh, this, is a, this is a wonderful opportunity to really put a footprint right in the middle of town and, and really make a statement and say that the arts are here, the, the creative arts are here, and, and this is a marvelous opportunity. So thank you for your work. Yep. Thank you. I think we're all in agreement that the top lot should be elsewhere. Yeah, nothing mm -hmm. against splash pads. Oh, no, nothing against <laughs> I mean, yeah, we no, want them the, in as many places, but nah. if this is the civic park that's supposed to host a few thousand people event may it may be encumbering a usable space makes all the sense in the world and uh, we can certainly work with the director in terms of parking and how that parking is utilized again opportunity to have uh, spaces where you can do uh, setups but you know if you're gonna have bands come in and they have bands or whatever it happens to be or the equipment, equipment rental or whatever it happens to be you want to have some additional space to be able to do that um, so, we'll be glad to uh, work with you on that and, and get that done. We, I hear you loud and clear, and Nick, I think uh, we're on the same page, and uh, we'll make the adjustments and come back to you. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank you. Appreciate really it. appreciate it. <clears throat> it's nice when we're in the beginning. Uh, all right, let's go to item number nine. Community Services Director comments. Sure, we will be very brief. I know the hour is getting late. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Alan to do a real quick overview of park improvements uh, that uh, we try to bring to you every single month. So, Alan. Thank you, Director Lennox. Uh, the first slide is uh, the Capital Projects Tracking Report. It's just a, a placeholder. You have the report uh, in front of you. It's just a general update of all the projects that we were uh, Community Service Department is working on. Uh, next slide is the planter project at uh, Laomash Park. Uh, the left top picture is the planter area before, uh, just empty with old irrigation uh, rotors. Uh, the picture on the right is a new installation of the point-to-point -point drip irrigation. The bottom left picture is the two-rail fence layout uh, for uh, Lyle Marsh Park. And the picture on the right is an example of the type style of two-rail fencing we'll be installing. Just to add to this a little bit, uh, the upper left-hand corner picture is actually somewhat through the process. Before this was scraped, it was uh, full of uh, sort of... Uh, aged honeysuckle <laughs> with a lot of bald spots and irrigation was uh, rotor style over a pretty long distance uh, those rotors were at the around, along the perimeter of the, the planter um, so the point to point is uh, to address what one of the commissioners said earlier a way to reduce uh, our annual impact on the CSA funds and create a savings over time and that bottom left-hand corner picture is really the full scope of the project there. So each of the red areas, there's four planters overall. So this will be replanted with landscaping, is that right? Yes. Where the point-to-point -point drip is. And is that uh, recycled water? Currently, this uh, park is plumbed for recycled water, but it's still domestic water. Okay. I have a, a question on the, the two-rail fence. I noticed is the, the tan. It, is that the becoming the industry industry standard? Because I noticed a lot of that going. It's a it's a tan color. The, the tan white color stuff wears out. It's a lot easier to maintain. The white is uh, it, it it shows. You yeah. know. So yes, it is. It is a nice alternative. Yeah. Okay. And, and the reason for the fencing, the two row vinyl fencing along the perimeter, is uh, the reason. Well, another reason why it was balding 
in the planters was not just age, it was also due to people traipsing through to get into the park. So the two-row fencing is to sort of focus their entry points. The next slide is uh, projects that occurred or repair work that occurred at Otto Murphy Ranch Park. Uh, the, t the left picture is the um, installed, or sorry, the uh, previous installed paper hand towels. Uh, it, they were retrofitted uh, using Accelerator Eco model uh, new hand dryers. Uh, that save, saves staff time for uh, installing uh, paper hand towels. Since that park is used heavily, uh, staff would have to replace uh, paper hand towels quite often. And then, um, and it saves money uh, for the hand towels. Uh, about two weeks ago, we had some copper theft at Automobile Ranch Park. Uh, I believe uh, two basketball lights and two park walkway lights uh, were vandalized. Wires were stolen from the poles. Um, it took about one week for uh, repairs, and we added additional uh, metal banding around the uh, plates of the light poles throughout the whole park. And that completes my presentation. Thank you, Alan. Uh, takes us to commissioner comments. Actually, just a couple, one other thing sorry. to add, I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to extend an invitation to the commission and see if there was a, perhaps a one commissioner who may be able to volunteer. Uh, at the end of, I believe it was last week on Friday, was the deadline for the Youth Advisory Committee applications. Uh, this is a new committee, uh, similar to what the commission's new, um, and it is intended to be comprised of 11 youth uh, throughout the Manatee community. Uh, age range from 15 to 25 uh, who can advise the, the city and the city council on any issues related to youth within the city boundaries. Uh, so we've received 16 applications and we'd like to go through those and do an interview process with those candidates uh, and are seeking uh, the assistance of a commissioner if possible to sit on a panel. Um, we are targeting the end of next week. Um, we do have also a volunteer from the senior advisory committee to sit on that panel. So. Certainly would entertain any volunteers. Uh, which day are you planning on doing this? We haven't set it, and that's intentional because we want to see if there are some availability issues with any commissioners or any other folks on the t on the panel. Well, I, I for one, am not available from the first. I'm, s yeah, from the first to the fifth. But uh, I could do it the eighth or uh, the tenth. And the timing of it would be during non-school hours, obviously, so because the majority of the applicants are in high school. We do have some uh, applicants from uh, the college as well. So you would do it late afternoon? Correct. If it's on a weekday, yes. For me, the 10th would be better, or the 12th. <clears throat> I'd be happy to do it as well. Mr. Schumer? Yes. How many applicants? How many applications were turned in? 16 total. 16? 16. Wow. That's not very good. It's a, sl it's a small number, but I, again, it is the first year, so it, typically it takes a while to ramp up. Uh, did do a committee like this in another city, uh, and I found that their first year they had six applications, uh, and their committee size is 15 now, or up to 15. Uh, and then by the time I left that agency, uh, they were receiving 20 plus applications each year. So it does build up. You have to sort of create a reputation for yourself. Do, do they get uh, civic service credit with the school district? Yes, absolutely. So they, they typically will be able to, we, we as staff will sign off on their, their hours, community service hours for time spent with the committee. Right, yeah. It looks good on a resume too. Yeah, it does. College application. So you'll get back to whatever you need. Sure. It's, if I'm hearing correctly, then the, uh, the Chair Rosen is available, and so is uh, Vice Chair um, Zimmerman. And so we will coordinate that with each of you. All right. That brings us to item 10, Commissioner Comments. Gentlemen, any further comments? Hearing none. Uh, item 11, future agenda requests. We had one earlier, Tom, wasn't it? Right, we were going to talk about the park, which is in the Paris city limits, but we seem to be the users. Um, but I think we did ask 
that that become a future agenda item. So we already have that to be a future agenda item to speak about using Cabian and uh, asking uh, the county parks to discuss it with us. We also do have, obviously, the priority list. You all went through at the workshop, so we'll be pulling from that for future items. This this is a standing uh, agenda item in case something comes up that you'd like to add to that list, uh, either as a top priority or something to do, you know, a little later on. Well, KBN is not a top priority, so, yeah. <clears throat> Anything else? Yeah, I would like to see follow-up on what happens with the skate park and the parking. Next oh, yeah, we will. Yeah, absolutely. We'll meet with Public Works, and, and I, no doubt it won't just be coming back to you all. It'll likely go to council, too. It's a, it's a big deal. So, uh, There is just one other item I'd like to uh, bring up. Um, we typically meet on the fourth Thursday of the month. Um, as it happens, the fourth Thursday of September is a major holiday uh, and I would like to request um, that perhaps we could meet on the third instead of the fourth this time. Uh, can't do the third or fourth, okay. Okay. Um, Could we meet on a different day other than a Thursday? Tuesdays. There's no city council or planning commission anymore. How about? Everything's on Wednesdays. Yeah, everything's on Wednesday. Uh, just... this, this month. I'm talking about September. Yeah. The 18th. That, that might work. You sure? Because I don't want to do it if it's going to interfere. Okay. All right. So could I ask that we, just for September, uh, change from the fourth Thursday to the third Thursday? Okay. Yeah, you just motion account to um, cancel the next month's regular meeting and reschedule it for the, the date that you've mentioned, the 18th. Okay. I think it was the 18th, uh, correct? I would move that we do that. May I have a second? I'll second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. OK, uh, if there's nothing else, and hearing nothing, I'm going to adjourn this meeting.